Song of Solomon, chapter 1, I'm going, to beginning, I'm going to begin in verse 1, just down to verse 4 today. We're still doing uh, introductory type of lessons right now. So Song of Solomon, chapter 1, starting in verse 1, down to verse 4, the Bible says, The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Remember, we talked about this that last week. Solomon felt like this was the best work that he had ever done. Writes a thousand, uh, uh, what is it, three thousand proverbs and a thousand songs, thousand and five songs. He thinks this is the best work that he ever did. Um, different people, you know, there's, since, the, since the, it's not written and preserved uh, in the per, part of the preserved word of God, it's impossible for us to know exactly the, the, when it was written in the setting. I believe what happened is, I, I think that, uh, that the, he writes the Proverbs kind of throughout his life. He writes the book of Ecclesiastes towards, after he's kind of got himself right, once he realizes the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments, he says, let me go through and tell you what my experience was in the world. And I think the last thing that he writes is the Song of Solomon. And this is a man who has ruined his life at least in the area of relationships. Uh, he has no control of himself sexually, has had not, no control of himself sexually as a young person. He has ruined his love life. And I think what he does is he writes the Song of Solomon at the, toward the end of his life. And I think it is uh, uh, not to be taken as a literal story of his love for a particular woman. But uh, instead, he is writing a play. He's writing a song, uh, um, uh, a, 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 an allegory on what relationship ought to be and, and, uh, and, and how re there, there are dangers and, and, uh, and there are enemies to a good relationship, uh, but what a good relationship ought to be. Song, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, verse 2, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savior, savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as uh, ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, uh, draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. Uh, he will, uh, we will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. And let's pray. Uh, Father, I want to ask you today that your Holy Spirit now will bless the Sunday school lesson. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, all of your word. And, um, and I want to pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, allow uh, this lesson this, the, uh, this lesson and the ones to follow as we go through um, this uh, Old Testament song, uh, that it would be uh, beneficial and helpful, that it would grow us in, in our spiritual life, Lord God. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. All right, so uh, two similar but extreme positions uh, are often taken about the Song of Solomon. Uh, one position is, goes like this. A person can say that the, the book, the Song of Solomon, is too graphic to belong in the Word of God. It cannot be a holy book. And there are those who say it does not belong in the Bible. God's name is not there and, this, and the subject is terrible. Um, uh, you, that's what some would say. I, uh, we, we went to the couples retreat. I kind of had some ideas of what I was hoping would work and there were some things that did work and some things that didn't. One of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to set it up so that that uh, when we were in our little meeting room, that they, we would have the Song of Solomon playing, uh, an audio version of the Song of Solomon. And I, so I found this on, 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 online, I found uh, on YouTube, I found um, um, a, it's a dramatized version of the Song of Sol Solomon, King James Version, uh, Song of Solomon. And so what it is, is it's a guy reads the parts that would have been the male part, and the lady reads the parts that would be the lady's part, and goes through there. And I was thinking we'd have that on, and in my mind, I wasn't thinking we'd all have to sit there and you'd be quiet, hush up, time to listen to the Bible. I wasn't going to do that. I was thinking we'd have it in the background and so forth. Well, number one, I went in there to, you know, I had it online, and so I got in the room, and I couldn't get my computer to work. And so, you know, and you know how those things, I played it all day long in our, in our room, to make sure it all worked, I got into the meeting room and it wouldn't work. And anyway, I had some problems. But one of the things on YouTube, when there's things on YouTube, you've got these little presentations, but there's also comments. And um, I thought this was interesting on the Song of Solomon. Most of the comments about the Song of Solomon were negative. You disgusting Christians. You talk about your holy religion and your holy life and you don't, you know, your, your standards on marriage and homosexuality and yet you consider the book of Song of Solomon, um, you know, a holy part of the scriptures. You disgust me. 
This book is disgusting. And, you know, and, and there are people who say the Song of Solomon is disgusting. It doesn't belong in the Word of God and too graphic and those kind of things. Uh, that's one extreme. Another extreme would be um, to say something like this, like that the book is uh, too graphic to speak of spiritual things. You know, there would be some who would say, yes, this is a, you know, a valuable piece of scripture, no question about it, but, uh, but it's much too graphic to be spiritual. It's, we ought not to look at it as a spiritual book of the Bible. We ought to look at it as a piece of scripture that God gave us to help us um, in our marriage relationships, in our love life with our, with our spouse, and, 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 and see it strictly for its benefit to the earthly marriage relationship. And there are a number of people, in fact, I mentioned last week, a growing number of them since probably 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, a growing number of people. Uh, um, I, I think I found one exception. Uh, there may be more, but I, so far I've only been able to find one exception of a contemporary uh, Bible teacher who believes that the Song of Solomon should be applied to Christ and his love for the church. Since about 30, 25 or 30 years ago, uh, a shift has taken place so that now everyone teaches it as um, relating to the, to the marriage relationship. And in fact, most of them say it does not. Most of the more, more modern uh, writers, Bible students, people at least you can find who are published on the Song of Solomon, they all say it's even, they, some of them say it would be heresy to teach that it has to do with Christ in the church. That this is a, uh, a passage that needs to be interpreted literally. It needs to be understood of a man and a woman in the bedroom and that God has put it the, uh, there for us so that we can have a healthy relationship and to use it any other way is to abuse scripture and that's kind of the more modern way uh, to look at it. I want to suggest to you that, that neither the idea that the passage ought to be thrown out uh, or the idea that the passage should only be considered, uh, should only be looked at as a, a, you know, a practice practical passage on uh, the husband and the wife. And so I want to suggest to you that neither one of those is accurate and that, um, and the, and that both of them stem, uh, both of those ideas stem from man's perverted view of human love. How many of you understand that we're corrupted beings? Yeah, we're corrupted. And we view just about everything uh, in a corrupted, from a corrupted lens. And, um, and I believe that in the area of morality, sexual morality and so forth, that it's actually growing worse that we are, as the years go on, we are becoming more and more perverted, more and more, uh, um, more and more um, um, lustful and more and more corrupted in our view of things that have to do with, uh, with sexuality and human sexuality. Um, not, not saying that, that, you know, that mankind has ever been uh, uncorrupt other than for Adam and Eve uh, ever since they sinned and when they, after they sinned and recognized that they were uh, naked, ever since then man has been corrupted in the area of sex and has looked at the, the at this subject of sexuality from a corrupted position, but I believe that it's getting worse, not better as time goes on and uh, a number of reasons for that. First of all, at one time the only way a person could could get enticed, could be enticed morally would be through an illicit relationship pretty much. Um, I was, I thought about, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than this. This is an, I did choose to do this class during the adult Sunday school hour rather than when everyone would be put together. But I'm smarter than to give you illustrations of what I'm, you know, so I, I and, and even smarter than to look up illustrations for these things. I, I was trying to think in my mind, did, did, the, did the cave drawings, the hieroglyphics, do there, is there any pornography in that? I don't remember any, I do know that by the time you get sculpture there is. But if you consider early on, um, there is the only way a, a person could be enticed, uh, um, in a, you know, um, with the illicit um, sex would have been through a, a wrong kind of relationship because there wasn't a printed word. There was no photography in those days. Um, by the time um, of the Greek Empire, by the time the Greeks were, uh, were, 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 were growing and beginning to become a, a major uh, force in the world, by that time there were already sculptures and you know as well as I do that a lot of them 
them were, um, were lewd in, in their character, which uh, I don't think, you know, the art world would say, well, it's just, you know, exploring, you know, you know, the beauty of humanity and so forth. No, I think it is evidence of the corruption of humanity that they would do things like that. And, and so there was, you know, there were those things, the, the, the sculptures and, and uh, the paintings by the time just, bef just previous to the Lord Jesus Christ. But early on, that's all they, there would have been. There was either an, uh, uh, an, uh, an affair that you shouldn't have or the, a handful of people people would have had access to sculptures and paintings, um, you know, that were, that were um, uh, Im immodest and immoral and so forth. Then, uh, though, after that, now we're talking about the progression of immorality, then comes the printing press. And the printing press was an incredible boon sp for the spiritual world. Uh, it was because of the spiritual, uh, because of the printing press that, the, that Protestantism could do what Protestantism did. All of a sudden, it was possible for anyone to have a copy of the Word of God. And we had people just previous, previous to the printing press that, uh, that had uh, translated the Bible into the language of the common uh, person. And now comes the printing press and they can make it available to everybody. It's, it's something that anyone can get a hold of and it changes the world uh, in that time. Uh, previous uh, to, the, to the translation of the Bible into the common language in the printing press, you, what you've got is you've got uh, the Catholic system who is telling people you don't worry about the Bible, we'll read it and tell you what it says, we'll give you what the important parts of it, or you had the Anabaptists that were up in the woods and had pieces of the scripture and they were tenaciously holding on to truth and to the word of God I mentioned this in other classes, teaching their children, whole, their children would memorize whole books of the Bible uh, so that, and, and that was how they had the Bible is through the memory of it, not because everyone had a copy of it, but because they, they memorized the word of God, they had had it uh, locked into their into their memories. They were teaching their children from I mean uh, evidences that that early on in the dark ages the Anabaptists were teaching setting up schools and teaching children to read and to write so that they could have the Word of God so that they could make sure we had the Word of God uh, today. And that's how we've gotten the Word of God. Not because you know uh, they were printing up lots of them, but because uh, the Anabaptists were protecting it and preserving it uh, uh, themselves in that period of time. But uh, so. There is the printing press comes along, and now the Word of God can be mass produced and it can be given to anyone uh, uh, practically. And it's got a there is a huge boon spiritually because of the printing press, but there is also a terrible fall that happens with the invention of the printing press because as soon as people could, could publish books, there are people who were writing books that were immoral. And you know, now I'm, I, most of us in this room, we would probably look at some of those books that were written shortly after the printing press, uh, and we'd say that's not immoral. I mean, that's you know, those are classics. But um, but those classics, in many cases, have things that that are uh, and they, that that press the envelope sexually in their day, and which is what art, art has always done. Art has always pressed the envelope. Let's get as much sex into the art world as we can. People will reject it if we get too much, so let's just push it, push it, push it. And when they get used to this a little bit, we'll push it a little bit more, and we'll keep going. And so there's the printing press, and now there's books. And, and again, I've said this before in, in other messages. It, it's amazing to me, um, 100 years ago, 50, 75 years ago, preachers preached against reading novels. Romance novels and things like that. And now we've got pastors who write romance novels. Not that long ago, it would have been considered absolutely wrong, and uh, to do not because it was a waste of time, but because what it's doing is it is um, it is creating a wrong kind, a wrong view of of morality, of sexuality. It's creating, it's stirring up passions that should not be stirred up. And then all of it, then there, there's the, there is the, um, the printing press and then comes along the radio and now you can take those same romance stories and now you can put voices to them. And you can get the sultry, seductive voice and the, you know, the deep masculine voices and you can have that same 
uh, that same um, uh, story, but now you, can, you don't have to imagine what it sounds like. You can, uh, you can hear it uh, broadcast over the radio. And now, then comes that, right after that, comes the television and the movie theater. And just like art has always done, I said, uh, art or the television and the movie house both began very, from the very beginning to press as much sex upon the public as the public would allow them to consume, uh, would allow them to do, and, the, and, and, and give them as much much as they possibly could but again the more they press the more accustomed the public has become to sexuality so that today the mo even the most modest of Christians would think nothing of being entertained by something sexual by going to a movie that has a very good storyline but there are sexual scenes in it and so you know well you just got to put up with that kind of stuff we years ago um, took my family we were we my family Anita and Bo and Caleb they were Bo and Caleb were uh, neither, I don't think either one of them were 10 years old. And we went over to a, to a, to a house, a family's house, one of my, my wife's relatives. Uh, I think we were there for Thanksgiving or something, and there was a movie uh, that they were playing. It was a very popular movie. This family, uh, part of a new family, was pretty well off. And so they had all of the fanciest gadgets for those days. And, and, um, and uh, they have a movie on that's very popular and uh, at the time it was uh, it, uh, showing and so forth and so they've got it on while we're eating our Thanksgiving dinner and there are people swearing and cursing like you just wouldn't believe and 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 so we're sitting out, out at the table to eat and and I just stopped them and said my kids and I can't can't partake in Thanksgiving dinner with this kind of language going on and uh, and my wife's niece she said Marvin, don't you understand? This is how real people talk. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not how real people talk. That's how the movie industry wants you to talk. <laughs> so they're trying to push. And yet what was on that movie, that was back in the, the mid-80s. Um, probably everyone in this room would have no problem watching that movie now. Back in the 80s, I was like, ah! Oh! And yet probably everyone in here has watched that movie. I don't even remember what it is now, but <laughs> I just remember. But, you know, probably everyone has watched that movie now and, and would think nothing of it because the movie house so now has gone so far beyond what was in that show that it's, uh, that it's amazing. And, and then... Today, not only do we have television and movie, we've got the internet uh, where, um, where sex traffic is almost completely unrestrained. Uh, so much so that uh, our children, the children of today, are so, uh, so exposed to sexual content that now we've got, uh, the, you see, read about it in the, in the papers all the time, 11 and 12 year olds who are sexting and sending pictures of themselves to boys. Um, because they're just so inundated with with that kind of that kind of uh, thing today that it just don't th they don't see anything um, uh, wrong with it. And what all this has done is it's messed up our concept of intimacy. It's messed up how we think of sexual intimacy, and so that we assume we uh, we assume with sexual intimacy we assume filth rather than virtue. I didn't keep the article, and I wish I could, because uh, the one thing, one of my really bad things is I read something, and say, "Oh, that's good," and then when I get up here, I can only remember it in the vaguest terms, and it's not even close to right. And uh, and but it was a, a study that they did about college students, and 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 college students, um, um, what they think when they see a person with a smartphone, looking at a smartphone, what they think when they see a person at a library looking at a computer screen and they think the average college college student thinks you must be doing looking at something sexual if you're looking at a computer screen at a library or at your smartphone you're probably looking at something um, you know sexual something immodest and those kind of things because to them that's just life that's what people do people look at at things and listen to things and watch things that uh, that have that are immodest they think that way about it and and the problem and what it's again it's it's created in our minds a a, a, a twisted sense of, of, of intimacy and it's created in our, in our minds a way when we read the Song of Solomon that we read into it 
things that are twisted, things that are perverted, things that are filthy, rather than things that are, that are virtuous, because that's, I mean, our whole life has been exposed to that, so we read into it what is our life, and our life is corrupted, and, and we read into it that, those kinds of things. And so, uh, I'm just going to have to read this statement so that I, uh, for you, just how I've got it in my notes here to help me get past this. The problem with studying the Song of Solomon is that we're going to imagine things in this book that would not have been thought of 150 years ago. People wouldn't have thought like we, 150 years ago, like we think today. It's going to be difficult for some, for instance, to move past fleshly thoughts to allow God to speak to their spirits. And some are going to want to feed on, feed on the lustful imaginations rather than let God's word feed their soul. Um, so some people, all they're going to think is, oh, pastor, that's embarrassing. And some people say, oh, pastor, more of that. It's because of the way that we think. But I'm, going to, I'm just going to tell you, we have to go through the Song of Solomon. We've got, to, we've got to go through the Song of Solomon because we're losing the battle for the souls of spiritual men and women these days. Uh, even in the very best of churches, preachers are, preachers are often guilty of doing what is the safe thing or the expedient thing or what is the thing that will pacify and build a congregation rather than striking at the heart of the sin problem. So we've got to get to the sin problem. We've got to deal with the sin problem. And, um, but I'm not going to do it today. I'm just going to still on the introduction, so more to come later. So three things this morning I want to talk about. Um, uh, as we get into this thing, let me see if I can get this working here. And Brother David, uh, yeah, help me out a little bit. So point number one in my notes this morning is going to be this. Our problem is that we do not, uh, and, and as we look in the book of Solomon, whoops, did, I must have pushed that button, yeah. We look into the, the book of the Song of Solomon, one of the reasons why I think that in, in modern society, most preachers today want to talk about the marriage relationship rather than the relationship of Christ and his church is because people today do not relate to the concept of loving the Lord Jesus Christ. We use that term so flippantly anymore, you know, well, this person, I know he never went to church, and I know that he never read the Bible, and I know they never sang a hymn, and I know that he never talked about, about people about Jesus. In fact, I know that he probably never even really uh, uh, believed in Jesus, but I do know that he loves God. People talk like that all the time. You know, well, I, you know, I know my, this relative of mine wasn't a Christian and, you know, in the standard sense of the word, but they did love God. People talk like that all the time. We, have, we don't understand what love is, and, and I think so. Uh, the love of the Lord is. And so uh, our problem, I think, with understanding the Song of Solomon is that we don't personally know what it means to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the very best churches, Christians have such a poor relationship with the Lord that we're embarrassed to express love for him. Um, a preacher back in 1858, a preacher by the name of A.L. Newton, published a book um, called The Song of Solomon Compared with Other Scriptures, 1858. In the book he wrote this, he said, thus the book, Song of Solomon, thus the book is full of Jesus. But it is Jesus in a in peculiar character, he says. It is not Jesus in the Song of Solomon, he's not seen as the Savior, he's not seen as the King, he's not seen, seen as High Priest, he's not seen as Judge, he's not seen as Prophet, he's not seen as the Captain of our salvation, he's not seen as the Shepherd of the sheep, he's not seen as the Mighty God, he's not the King of Kings in the Song of Solomon, nor is he the people's surety. He says, no, it is dearer and closer, it is a dearer and closer relationship. Wait a minute, before I go on here just a little bit. Dearer and closer than my Savior? There is a relationship with Christ that can be closer than my Savior? There is a relationship with Christ that I can have than closer than he is my shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And yet there is something closer than Jesus, my shepherd? He says he's not, in the Song of Solomon, he's not our Savior, he's not our prophet, he's not our, the captain of our salvation, he's not the shepherd of the sheep, he's something dearer and closer than that. This is Jesus as our bridegroom. Jesus in marriage reunion with his bride, his church. End quote there. 
So our problem today is that the very best Christians we have know Jesus as all of those things, Savior, King, High Priest, Judge, Prophet, Captain, Shepherd, God, King of Kings, Surety, the one who's holding us safe, uh, safe and uh, know him, uh, the best Christians know him as all of those things, but they don't know him as the lover of their soul. Their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ comes short of a love relationship with God. That's what he said, and it's got to be corrected. We've got to fix this thing. It's got to be corrected. We've got to address this great sin. We don't love Jesus. We're saved. We're obedient. We're servants. We can be a lot of things, but today... For the most part, we don't love Jesus. And it is a huge problem, and it is why, it is why the, the common pastor today chooses to teach the Song of Solomon as having to do with husbands and wives rather than Christ and his church because he knows his congregation can't grasp a, a Christ that people can love. In fact, he probably doesn't love Christ. He probably can't grasp Christ that way either. And so our problem is that we don't love Christ and it messes up how we look at the Song of Solomon. Number two, um, so what about the Song of Solomon? A few things to kind of, we're still introductory probably next week. Actually next week will probably still be intro, not next, yeah next week will still be introductory uh, and then we'll get into actually studying the Song of Solomon a few weeks from now. But uh, some things, what about the Song of Solomon? I'm just quoting this A.L. Newton again. He says this, he says the Song of Solomon is to be understood as the mutual interchange of affections of the bridegroom and the bride. Um, back in the 1700s, America produced what is, who is still considered the greatest, the, the greatest theologian that America has ever produced. And uh, he wrote the sinners, sinners in the hands of the angry God. And I just lost his name, Jonathan uh, Edwards, and, uh, and considered to be the, the greatest theologian America, the United States of America has ever produced. But he also wrote a huge volume that has to do with the affections for Christ. The idea of affections, love. It, that, that a real relationship with Christ requires affection. Love for him. Love for him. And Newton says the same thing. Uh, it is, uh, Song of Solomon is to be understood as the mutual interchange of affections of the bridegroom and the bride. It is the experience of the soul towards Christ in this particular relationship. The Song of Solomon is meant to describe how you love Jesus and how he loves you. That's what it's meant to do. Um, this understanding of the Song of Solomon that way, previous to 25 or 30 years ago, and I can't say that I mentioned the book um, by uh, David Jeremiah, what the Bible says about love, marriage, and sex. Uh, I can't say that that's where the change started, but that's the first book that I'm aware of um, where all of a sudden Jeremiah says, Song of Solomon, I mean, it might teach something about uh, Jesus in the church. If you want to get that out of it, I mean, I guess that's more power to you. But he says that is not what the book is about. The book is about a husband and wife. And he's the first one. But prior, uh, but, but that was about 25 years ago, 30 years ago when that was written. Prior to that book, almost everyone that I can find, in fact, everyone that I can find prior to then, all believed that the Song of Solomon taught Christ's love for the church and a believer's love for Christ and taught that. Uh, for instance, give you some for instances here. Uh, and I think, my, my, I think your notes and my slides are going to kind of mess up just a little bit here, going to be a little different. So uh, I'm going to, I'll try to get back to this for you, see if I can make sure we get through this. So I, I wanted, in my notes, I tried to put these in, in a chronological order, but then I found that one of my quotes was a little too long to fit on a slide, so I separated it out. And so uh, chronologically, see, Charles Spurgeon, in the 1850s, Charles Spurgeon um, was well known for saying that he, his favorite title for the Lord Jesus Christ was My Well Beloved. He got that title from the Song of Solomon. Uh, he didn't call Jesus Lord, dear Lord. Uh, he didn't, you know, 
talk about, you know, uh, you, sometimes today, you know, you hear people saying, well, it's, you know, you shouldn't really call Jesus Jesus. You could, should call him Jesus Christ because, you know, he's, it's not respectful to call him just by his first name. You should be calling him Jesus Christ. Uh, he, uh, 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 Spurgeon didn't call him anything. His, his favorite term when, when speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ was to call him my well-beloved. He got it out of the Psalms or out of the Song of Solomon. And he believed, he, he, he felt like he wanted to express that kind of love for the Lord. Now, um, let me see in my notes, I want to pass up here, I'm going to this one. Uh, uh, Harry Iron, Ironside in 1933 uh, wrote a book, uh, or a small work, it's not really a book, I don't think, it's more like a booklet on, um, on the Song of Solomon. And in it, he says this about the song, he says, it is a singularly delightful portion of the Word of God. And I know in this little quote that I've given you here, it doesn't speak spe specifically about Jesus, but when you read his work, you find out he's talking about the reason it's so delightful is he's talking about the love a Christian can have for Jesus and the love that Jesus expresses for us. I'll come back to uh, the next slide there. Yeah. And then this book, um, written in 1909, published in 1909, um, writer by the name of J.G. Bellet uh, wrote this. Let me kiss, or let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. She had been keeping the vineyards, attending to the things abroad, but now was learning that her own vineyard had been neglected and the deeper things of personal fellowship are longed for. The saint is leaving Martha's and taking Mary's place, longing to feed under his own eye and from his own hand and not another's. And what he's talking about in the story of the Song of Solomon, you've got this, this Shulamite girl that she's working out in the fields and she's taking, it's her brother's vineyards and she's working in her brother's vineyards and it's made her where her skin is black and she says don't look at me my skin's black and uh, and comely I'm not you know I'm not uh, attractive don't look at me because I haven't taken care of me myself and she she says that I haven't taken care of myself I've been too busy doing this to not to take good care of myself and what Bella is saying is that in the Song of Solomon she says I've got to start taking care of my own vineyard that is my own relationship with Jesus Christ and then Bellet, Bellet um, moves us into the New Testament and the story of Martha and Mary. Remember Martha, she's cumbered about much serving. She goes to complain to Jesus, get my sister to work. There's people to feed. There's, you know, rooms to clean. There's, there's work to be done. And all she wants to do is sit at your feet and learn from you. And, and uh, you know, Martha, Martha, you're cumbered about much serving. She's chosen the thing that's needful. Mary. And every one of us need to come to, you know, I think America is filled with today Christians who are real good at Martha business and doing the work and being about the service and, and but, but have very, very um, um, uh, shallow, if almost non-existent relationships with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Song of Solomon then is the story of a believer who longs to move from a mere servant of Christ relationship to a lover of Christ's relationship. That's what's going on in this book. And this, this, that therefore, becomes a very, very important passage of Scripture, not because it teaches us how to have a good marriage, but because it teaches us how to have a good walk with Christ. It becomes a very, very important thing. So here's the question. Can you handle that kind of intimacy with Jesus? Or will you settle to keep him at an arm's length? And I'll be honest, I think most Christians always keep Jesus at an arm's length. It's, it'd get embarrassing to get too close to Jesus. If I got too close to Jesus, people would start picking up on it. If I got to, too close to Jesus, there are people who would think I was weird. If I got too close to Jesus, people would notice. They'd start looking. And I don't want to have that kind of relationship with Jesus. Can you handle a, a intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you choose to maintain um, an awkward, uneasy walk with the Lord? Or will you decide to take his arm, embrace his affections, and begin to pour out your own affections upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you settle to have Jesus as your Savior and King, Shepherd and High Priest and Captain? Or will you begin to take him as your Bridegroom, the lover of your soul? What, which will you do? And which... 
which will you do? Will you say, you know what, I'm satisfied with my Christian life where it is. I don't really want any more from Christ than I'm getting, than I've got right now. I, I don't want him to change my life. I don't want my, my affections. I don't want my interests. I don't want my life to really change. I just want to be able to go to heaven and feel good about myself. I want to be happy today. I want to be comfortable today. And, and, uh, but I don't want, uh, I, and I want to know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want really to love Jesus Christ. And well, um, you're the kind of person that, um, that, um, that uh, David Jeremiah was looking for. Because you'll buy his book on marriage. Because you want your marriage to be happy. You want your love life with your spouse to be happy. And so you'll really enjoy Jeremiah's book because he's not going to talk about your walk with Christ at all or any of the other books that are out, by the way, more recently because he's not going to talk about Jesus at all. He's not going to tell you uh, how to walk with the Lord at all. He's just going to tell you how to be happy in your marriage. And you'll be ha real good. You'll be, be fine with a book like that. By the way, I'm not saying that that book isn't a, a good, uh, isn't a profitable book for marriage, but it isn't a profitable book for your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, other than if you and your wife aren't getting along, then you're not going to, prayers aren't going to get answered either. But uh, 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 you know, what are you going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? All right, I've got one last thing. I'm going to be done with this. So, um, Pastor, how are you going to handle the kind of sensitive things? In the Song of Solomon. <laughs> yeah, and are you going to get up and are we going to you know, go through, are you going to explain all these sensitive passages? Let me just, I'm just, I'll use for illustration here, uh, verse 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Pastor, are you going to explain to me um, how to do that or what are you going to do with this? And so how are we going to handle the the sensitive things. I didn't put this on the screen because I didn't want it in writing that you'd be able to read. But uh, here's how I'm going to handle it. Mostly superficially. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, mostly I'm not. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not going to go into the details. One book that I, that I read in studying for this se uh, preparation, studying for this series, and, I'll, and I've got to, I'll hustle up and get this thing through real quick. He said, he said you know, you've gotta, if, you, if you're going to be honest with the Bible, uh, you've got to let breasts be breasts and belly buttons be belly buttons and all those kind of things. And I was just going to tell you what I'm going to do. When we get to those passages, we're going to read them fast. And uh, not that I'm going to, not that I'm going to, uh, I, I, it's not just, that's not to say that I'm going to deal with the Song of Solomon kind of in a superficial way. We're going to take everything in, in, this, in this book seriously, but I do not believe the book is meant to be taken literally. I think it is meant to be taken as an allegory. In biblical hermeneutics, there is such a thing as some passages there, in biblical hermeneutics, there are things that should be understood allegorically or metaphorically. For instance, when uh, Jesus called Herod an, a fox, he didn't mean that Herod walked on four legs and had a bushy tail. He was, we know, you know, when he, if he calls a man a fox, he's speaking, using a metaphor there is what he's doing. And that's how I think you're supposed to take the, the Song of Solomon. I, I, I think that's the way you're supposed to do it. And, and um, I see it in that way. And so, for instance, let's look. It would be ridiculous to, uh, to attempt to, uh, to give a literal interpretation of uh, verse 2 if, in fact, I am, you know, if you use my, my understanding of the Song of Solomon that is talking about Christ's love for his people, it would be ridiculous for us to try to explain how do you kiss Jesus on the mouth or how does Jesus kiss you on the mouth. That's not at all the point of the passage. Here's the point. Here's the point. The point is that people who are in love with Jesus, who, people who are in love express that love without shame. People who are in love express that love without shame or embarrassment. I am not in the least, in the least embarrassed to kiss Anita right here on this platform in front of all of you. I'll kiss her on the mouth. Just bring her right up here. I'll do it right now. doesn't embarrass me at all. Why? Because I love her. And it's healthy for us to love one another. I love her and it's healthy for me to express my love for her. And I'm telling you, it's healthy for you to express love for Jesus Christ. And that's the point of the passage. Not that we're supposed to, how do I do this kissing thing with Jesus? That's not the point. The point is, you can be, you can be 
honest and upfront and open about your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to verbally and to emotionally express love for Jesus Christ and to expect that same love to be reciprocated from Jesus.